welcome to Eco Curious, a podcast which is here to help you to live a life that's kinder to the planet and yourself. I'm Julia Dye, founder of Super Planet, and in today's episode, the latest eco beauty movement you'll want to know all about, a deep dive into what global warming is and how it affects us, and I chat to Carol Le Cerf, who runs Bridal Reloved Liverpool and is the founder of Candle Collective UK, where she makes, you guessed it, candles which are hand poured, vegan, sustainably packaged and smell incredible. It's a juicy one, so grab a drink and let's get into it. So today I have three news stories for you. The first is from The Guardian and if I'm being really honest, I hesitated about sharing this one because I feel that it might be a little bit divisive, but it's something that I've been thinking about for a while since COVID-19 became an issue and I've seen a couple of other people share similar thoughts. So this story is titled, Promiscuous Treatment of Nature Will Lead to More Pandemics, Say Scientists. And the piece explains that scientists have concluded that deforestation, so when we cut down trees to make room for something else, usually agriculture, you know, farming, that kind of thing, it drives animals out of their natural habitat and into more human populated areas. And essentially that is what has caused the coronavirus pandemic and will probably cause more of them unless we do something about this. And I think that this topic can be a bit controversial because it's essentially saying that we've done this and the whole COVID-19 thing is our fault, which is quite confronting. But you know, it is it is human actions which have caused this and actually knowing that is really powerful because it means that we can change our ways to prevent it in the future. So the article goes on to explain that three quarters of new diseases in humans originate from animals. And that's because our activities are forcing animals who would not usually be anywhere near us, like bats, are more likely to be in contact with us because they've had to find somewhere new to live. And the scientists in this article are very quick to stress that we shouldn't be afraid of wildlife, but we need to recognise that it is human activity causing this issue by disrupting the ecological balance and forcing species that shouldn't naturally be close to one another into the same environment. And we can do something about that. There's a quote in this article by an epidemiologist at the University of California, Tierra Smiley Evans, which I love. So Tierra says, I'm hopeful that one of the most positive things to come out of this horrible tragedy will be the realization that there is a link between how we treat the forest and our well-being. It really impacts our health. It's not just a wildlife issue or an environmental issue. Hopefully now people can see just how much putting profit over the planet can negatively impact our own lives. Action will be taken. Next up, a slightly more cheerful story from Elle. So you've probably heard of green beauty before, but have you heard of Blue Beauty? Blue Beauty is a movement founded by Jeannie Jarno, I think I've pronounced that right, apologies if I haven't, who is also the founder of Beauty Heroes, which sells what they call healthy beauty products. Jeannie explains that Blue Beauty brands are making sure that their products are safe for the environment, which includes being ocean safe as well as sustainably sourced, minimizing their carbon footprint, etc., but are also looking at ways that their practices are contributing back to and having a net positive effect on the environment. So it's about limiting products plastic wastage, making it easier for us to recycle them, and also protecting our oceans from chemicals which are found in beauty products. For example, some creams often contain chemicals which damage the coral reefs. So which brands do Elle recommend as being part of this blue beauty movement? They have created a handy list, which I will include in the show notes as always, which includes Ren, Kevin Murphy, and L'Occitane. Finally, from the Financial Times, after a global pandemic, will companies still be able to afford to prioritise purpose over profit? There were concerns that crisis measures would mean that companies would abandon their better ethics in order to be able to bounce back after the pandemic. But as consumers are aware now more than ever of the importance of businesses working to reduce their impact on the environment, companies can't afford not to put purpose first. (laughs) 
Welcome to Sustainability Debunked, where we break down the myths, jargon and issues around climate change and the environment, and more importantly, what we can do about them. Each week, I'm joined by Jennifer Newell, a scientist based between Scotland and Sweden who specialises in studying the climate. She describes herself as a detective for the earth, studying the past to find out what the future holds. In this episode, Jennifer and I discuss what global warming and greenhouse gases are and the impact that they have both on the planet and our own lives. I think with topics like this, it's really easy to think of them as something that isn't a problem for us or just to not take it on as an issue because the terms can be a little bit alienating. So I asked Jenny to break it down and make it a bit more accessible. And she also shared some really interesting information about the politics of the terms that we use around this topic. Do you want me to say global heating or global warming? Because I've read that like global warming, it should be global heating. That's how we're supposed to refer to it now. Is that right? You know what? Like we should definitely have this conversation in the podcast. Global warming versus global heating is purely political. Okay. See when Trump got presidency in the US, yeah, took over running the country, basically he shut down science for a while and banned certain terms from being used firstly in the parliamentary system and in the media but then he started kind of essentially penalizing scientists for using these terms in our research and you know if you put in a proposal to study anything to do with climate change like the funding for that wasn't so so freely available anymore which is a really scary thought to think that one person and their views has the power to ban terminology because they don't believe in it and they don't really like what the consequences of listening to this issue and taking action are. They would much prefer business as usual. And so, yeah, going back to whether it's global warming or global heating, I honestly don't mind which is used as long as we're all aware that it is the same thing. Heating isn't a new thing, it's just this new term that was phrased because we weren't allowed to say global warming anymore. Oh my gosh, that is insane. You know, from from a science perspective, we're like, well, you know what? It's worse than global warming, actually. It, we're, we're really heating the planet and, and trying to find terms. But it is also an element of us finding terms that better portray the current situation as it evolving um but no really the primary driver in that is that because the terminology was no longer accepted i do feel like global heating is a bit more emotive and i think i read on the guardian they have like a whole environment section and they were talking about the changes to the terms that they were going to use and they said we're going to say global heating instead of global warming and we're going to say planet warming gases instead of greenhouse gases because they felt that it is a huge issue but it's quite easy to not feel connected to the original two terms yeah touch on a very true point there that i was saying it isn't just like the decision that we don't want to talk about these terms anymore we don't want to hear about global warming um it is also to have a, a consensus among the scientific community and and those doing science communication to try and reduce some of the overwhelming different terms and and what they all mean Um, like if we can all read from the same page it's going to help us communicate that message much better so what do we mean when we talk about global heating and planet warming gases? I'm just going to start by mentioning that attached to or linked with this this episode, you can see a lecture that I give on it that gives uh, the kind of full background um, to the climate in, in a very succinct and visual manner. So if you want to kind of go into this a wee bit further, I'm just going to give a summary at this point. Uh, then please take a look at that link there. So yeah, let's start with the the kind of fundamental system uh, and science behind this concern of climate change. And to start with, I'm going to take us out to the sun because that's where we actually get all of our energy. In terms of keeping terminology succinct and, and consistent, the sun provides the earth with energy, which is where we get our heat from. So the sun provides the, the earth with all of its heat, but it doesn't deliver that evenly across the planet. So if we think about the sun as a torch or a spotlight, 
if you shine a spotlight onto a sphere or like a, a globe, if you have one in the house, you'll see that it's focused at the equator or wherever you shine it. But obviously the sun for us is focused at the equator. And actually very little of that light from the torch reaches the poles. And in the same way, very little of the Earth's incoming heat from the sun reaches the poles. And so we have natural systems that have very nicely evolved as the planet has evolved that distribute this energy, this incoming energy, and move heat from the equators out to the poles. The primary ways of doing this is in the ocean. So ocean circulation is the kind of key driver of this heat distribution across the planet. And maintaining and regulating a planet that is suitable for humans to live on and, and for hosting life, not just human life. The other way of uh, circulating and kind of distributing that heat across the globe is, is through the atmospheric circulation. So oceanic and atmospheric circulation in the Earth is what allows the planet to, to host life. And if we didn't have that going on, the oceanic circulation bringing the heat that comes in at the Gulf of Mexico um, across the Atlantic into the UK. It's really a critical part, um, this, this energy distribution. And it's a natural cycle and it's changed through time. Uh, we understand this through like geological evidence within the kind of paleoclimate, which is where my, my field of research really studies, is looking at the climate through the past. Um, and we're talking millions of years, not just the recent past. There are cycles and we see the, the distribution um, patterns change and we see the overall temperature of the air fluctuate. It has been much hotter and it has been much colder. Funnily enough, when it was much hotter and much colder, there was not the same kind of complex life on Earth that manages to survive today. Like We are really sensitive to the current climate conditions. Like The Earth survives these, these different fluctuations and these cycles of climate change. It's our ability to survive on Earth that is threatened by change. We know that there have been these natural cycles and we see that temperature and the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere are intrinsically linked and that essentially the, through geological history and our understanding of, of how the climate has changed in the past, the temperature on Earth is regulated by the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Okay, so when we talk about greenhouse gases, what do we mean by that? Are there specific ones that are really bad and how are we contributing to the, the problem with them? So there's like so many different greenhouse gases that affect um, the planet. But the one that everybody knows of is carbon dioxide. And this is the key greenhouse gas because it plays such a large role in climate change, it's a rather long-lived and its effect is, is quite impactful. So many different greenhouse gases. Carbon dioxide is the one that tracks best with temperature through time and, and really seems to be a key indicator of the health of the planet in terms of temperature. Another one that's well known is methane. Methane is actually a much more powerful greenhouse gas. The, the effect of, of methane in the atmosphere is four times that of carbon dioxide. However, methane, it's not very long lived in the atmosphere. So the effect of methane is short lived uh, and kind of easy to respond to. There are other kind of like sulfides and, and other gases that come from like volcanoes. So it basically greenhouse gases work as a blanket in the system that we have like a lot of the, the fact that life is, is maintained on Earth is because we have these greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Like, like we should point out greenhouse gases are, are critical to, to life on Earth because they're what maintains the heat on Earth. It's like a, yeah. a blanket around the Earth because they reflect the heat back to Earth rather than letting it escape into space. And so we need greenhouse gases for, for the work. Like as we say, they they regulate the temperature on Earth. So while we're concerned about them at the moment because the Earth's temperature is rising, 
if temperatures were cooling drastically, the talk would be like, how do we increase these greenhouse gases? We need a thicker blanket on, on the earth. So greenhouse gases them, in themselves, they're not a bad thing, but the amount that we're producing them at the moment is the problem. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as I say, the, the greenhouse gases are critical for us to be able to, for, for regulating the temperature on earth. And they're a bad thing and are, you know, seen as, as a bad thing because they have increased significantly. And in fact, they've increased alarmingly. I spoke about the, looking through the geological history, like climate history of the planet. Never in all of the records that we have, have we seen the rate of increase that we see at present of the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and the consequence uh, that that has on temperature. So the, the temperature rise has never been this rapid. The buildup of greenhouse gases in, in the atmosphere to cause this warming have never happened this fast. And so that's really where it becomes, as we can say, a, a bad thing. And it's also where we can then start to talk about it being human caused. What happens if global heating does continue at at the rate it's at, what's the impact going to be on the planet and our lifestyle, I guess? That's a really good question because it's the the kind of crux of the issue. Apart from we will all die. <laughs> well, to be fair, we won't all die, um, but certainly the, the, the Earth won't be able to sustain the amount of life we have on mm. Earth at the moment. And, you know, like the, the climate crisis, it's really a, a kind of a number of issues compounding on top of one another. So we see that since the Industrial Revolution and as we've gone into this highly consumeristic like lifestyle that just demands so much of the planet, and as we are really reliant on fossil fuels for so much of that, we see this spike in greenhouse gases, the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. We know that the Earth systems are very sensitive to these changes. Um, so my field of research looks at how the volume of ice in, in terms of ice sheets on the land has changed through time. So I basically study, um, certainly at the moment, how the Antarctic ice sheet has been thicker and thinner in response to previous periods of climate change and now as you melt ice on the land that adds water to the ocean and increases sea level so we we already we've, we're all aware of, of sea level rise being a consequence of global uh, warming but there are many other consequences that are, are not as well spoken about and actually are much more impactful to like human life on earth so as I said at the beginning of, of this, like climate change, as, as we talk about it, isn't about saving the planet. It's about saving a planet that we can live on. And anybody that you, you know who is a farmer or is kind of, you know, grows their own vegetables in, in the allotment will know how sensitive the yield is to rainfall and to temperature, um, but primarily to rainfall, actually. And what we see with global warming is that weather patterns change. And so whereas you would have quite a stable growing season with quite predictable rainfall and temperatures, rather than having like steady rain throughout the season, we'll get these like, uh, like really intense downpours. And that's like devastating to, to the soils and to the crop. And yeah, these, these intense rainfall events stop us being able to, to grow the food as we need to, to, to maintain and feed the world's population. Or we think about, and the idea of statistics, and you'll see many different graphs and stuff, but one thing that we usually talk about is a bell curve. If you track the line, it starts at the bottom, goes up to a peak, and then follows the same pattern on the other side. And that's just like a, a normal distribution of data, whatever that data is. So we talk about the average global temperature changing. So that average global temperature is the peak of that bell curve. But we talk like you in agriculture, extreme events are what can completely decimate an annual yield or even like 
kind of for many years decimate the, the crop and ability to grow. So if we shift that average, we also shift the extremes. And so we're getting more and more of those extremes um, before we hit the, the average kind of temperature that would stop us being able to grow. Um, but essentially, so the main take home was, you know, we're, we're changing where we can grow the crops that sustain life on earth or we can you know raise the animals that that feed us that that take home is really quite shocking because that will be the first consequence of, of or one of the first consequences of the climate change is that we will begin to struggle to grow the food like the the crops will fail or you know you have things like the wildfires and that destroys crops like it was you know in Australia and in um, the the California wildfires there's been wildfires that like wiped out kind of growing lands or there was some like really bad flooding across much of, of the states the USA uh, like the Carolinas, and it was linked to uh, one of the hurricanes. We get more intense hurricanes and more intense weather, and these weather extremes are detrimental to so many things. Like, well, of course, they're they're devastating to human life where they occur, but they also begin to inhibit our ability to, to provide food for the planet. And how is our activity as humans causing this increase in greenhouse gases and global heating the scary part of it is as a scientist firstly seeing that all the evidence is pointing towards is going in this trajectory this this direction of business as usual with its devastating consequences and it's happening faster like each ipcc report where we're predicting things happening sooner and sooner or seeing things happening already that we were expecting maybe 50 100 years from now and it really i think goes back to we talk about going into the future these are all projections they're computer models that take all of the information that we have and they describe it mathematically and they uh, take the processes that we understand from happening by studying the past um, and apply those processes as, again, uh, mathematical expressions to then project what will happen into the future. The models are as good as the data that we put into them. And as we keep improving that data, we're seeing more and more. It is scary what we're facing, essentially. So then we try and look back in the past and be like, right, well, this has happened. We know we know that the climate has changed on, on Earth before. What evidence can we see to, to say, well, what can we expect under such circumstances? And as we look back at the paleoclimate record, the, the thing that stands out is nature doesn't produce these changes as quickly as we are making it happen. And just to debunk uh, a myth that's gone around for years, probably since climate change was an issue being discussed, or that it's all natural and, and that it's not caused by humans, we actually now know and have the scientific evidence to say this is caused by humans by mostly industrial pumping greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide being the main one, is, is causing this. Uh, where, and, you know, not just industrial, but as driving cars and, and the emissions from that and, and taking airplanes. Almost everything that we do, and, and going back to the, the episode of in Fast Fashion, and I highlighted the fact that the microplastics and, and clothes being made of plastic. And we cannot forget that anything that is made from plastic comes from fossil fuels. And any time that, that fossil fuels are used, we're adding carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And we can study the, the chemistry of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere at the atomic scale. And we use slight differences in the atoms of carbon and oxygen we, we call them isotopes the isotope analysis and isotope tracing to look at the slight differences in the atoms of carbon and oxygen which make up the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and these like slightly different atoms are like signatures and show us the source of where this carbon dioxide ha has come from to to a certain degree and and certainly whether it's uh, man-made or natural and so that's really the stump to this myth that we are not causing this change 
we can see there is a signature in the carbon dioxide and in, in the atmosphere that this is human driven. One of the scarier things that should also bring into this, in fact, let's not call it scary because we don't want to just put fear. And I'll come back to a solution on this as well. So, so don't we worry. But a kind of concerning part of the natural system is what we call these positive feedback systems. Mm-hmm. Um, the positive there is very misleading because these feedback systems essentially it, you know we cause one thing so we cause the the temperature to rise slightly um and let's use permafrost melting uh, as an example of this so at the the warmer temperatures cause melting of the ice the in permafrost regions which is where the ground is permanently frozen there are a lot of like greenhouse gases held in the organic material in that frozen soil and as we warm the temperature on earth and begin to melt that we release even more greenhouse gases because of this and it becomes almost a runaway system and again i mentioned in an earlier episode the the planetary boundaries that kind of summarizes you know where we need to get to to avoid these runaway systems getting into play But like I said, it isn't all doom and gloom because, as I mentioned at the very start, the the temperature on Earth is regulated by the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And it's very sensitive to these. So very quickly, we can change the situation. So what can we do to change that situation? So the first point would be, let's just reduce these emissions in the first place. This is being recorded at the time of the coronavirus peak, possibly, uh, certainly whilst we're in lockdown. We've seen that it is possible to reduce emissions like quite drastically. One of the things that took me by surprise is very early on in the lockdown, we saw pictures from China and we saw pictures from Italy. Within days of these lockdowns being implemented, the reduction in, in air pollution was almost instant and it was fantastic but even more so from a climate and a scientist perspective was you can measure these concentrations of greenhouse gases through satellites we can measure this and and look at the atmospheric composition and this is like the really positive like take home within days of these lockdowns being enforced we could see massive reductions in like nitrous oxides and stuff like this in the atmosphere i did not expect that these changes would happen so quickly i thought it would take much longer and that we wouldn't be able to see the impact and i think the fact that we can see the impact so quickly really helps in terms of that mentality and attitude to take and change because you can see the results of it so quickly but yeah what what we need to do is really move away from the The business as usual scenarios, Um, I'm sure most of our listeners have heard of the IPCC reports and, you know, the different scenarios. Last year, they released the the special issue on, you know, what are the, if we can keep uh, global temperatures within, you know, a 1.5 degree rise, like, what does that mean for the planet? And so these scenarios, like they are possible to be like it is within global society's means and it's all for advantage to be able to to change from business as usual to taking action and reducing those emissions and for us as individuals it comes down to again that idea of being a conscious consumer so thinking about do you really need to drive somewhere do you really need to take that flight or can you achieve what you're going to do without having to travel there. Yes, as individuals, we have little control over the carbon footprint of governments or the carbon footprints of big corporations, but we can choose not to support their idea that we can continue as normal by not giving them our money.
Today my guest is Carol Le Cerf, owner of Bridal Relove Liverpool, a bridal boutique which specialises in sample and pre-owned wedding dresses, and Candle Collective UK, a vegan hand-poured candle brand, of which I own many of her gorgeous candles. My favourite is Holiday Memories, if you're in the mood for a new candle. I'll leave the link to both Bridal Reloved and Candle Collective in the show notes. I interviewed Carol in her gorgeous bridal boutique in Liverpool, so there may be a little bit of background noise, apologies about that. And we talked about how to have a wedding which is kind to the environment, how to find candles which are good for your health and the planet, and why making an extra effort to find eco-friendly solutions is worth it over a copper. So I'm Carol, I'm the owner of Bridal We Love Liverpool on Egbeth Road. Um, Bridal We Love specialises in the sale of end of season X sample or pre-owned designer wedding dresses. Um, so it just means that you get a quality designer wedding dress but without the big designer price tag that goes along with it. Um, I'm also the owner of Candle Collective UK, um, which is all hand poured soy wax candles, wax melts, anything kind of home fragrance to make a nice kind of atmosphere in your home really. Fab. So how did you get started with your first business? So with Bridal Reloved, it's it's a bit of a random story, so I'll try I'll try and give you the sort of shortest <laughs> version of it. Um, basically, as you can tell from the accent, I'm not native native Scouser. <laughs> uh, I'm originally from Edinburgh. So, basically, the story when I met my now husband um, whilst we were both holidaying. I was actually on my friend's Hindu in Ibiza, and he was on his boss's stag do in Ibiza. Wow. And both groups were in the same hotel and kind of went on from there, you can get, get the gist of that story. <laughs> um, and after lots of travelling up and down, decided that one of us was going to move. Um, and at the time he was still studying for his engineering degree at university, so it was me that was going to come down. Um, at the time, I was actually a makeup artist, um, and I thought that trying to kind of re-establish myself as an artist with a client base down here would be quite difficult because they seem to be everywhere now makeup artists yeah, or self-proclaimed <laughs> makeup artists. Um, <clears throat> so randomly one day I had googled UK franchises mm-hmm. and Bridal We Loved was the second one that popped up and I thought, bridal shop? Yeah, I could absolutely see myself doing that. Um, always been interested in kind of bridal especially when doing like the bridal makeups and things like that I would always yeah. kind of hang around when <laughs> all the makeups had finished just to kind of see what the bride was going to wear help her get in her dress all that kind of stuff so I thought all the years of kind of um, dealing with brides and then previous to that being in kind of uh, cosmetics retail that sort of thing I thought mm-hmm. the retail background coupled with that would be uh, quite nice so Literally within six months, I had um, spoken to the franchise. I'd moved down. I'd opened the shop, and yeah, it was it was a bit of a whirlwind. But here I am, kind of three and a half, almost four years later. So wow, yeah. I didn't know you used to be a makeup artist. Yeah, yeah, oh, it's many many times. I'd done that for quite a while. Um, sort of show my age now, but I'd done it for a good sort of fifteen odd years, um, like cosmetic retail, so more kind of based in like department stores and things. Yeah, um, and I'd run. Um, a, a Bobby Brown account for a good six years, um, taking it up to the sort of million pound account. So it was like the largest account in Edinburgh and things wow. like that. So yeah, it was it was really good. I did enjoy my time doing that. So cool. So how does Bridal Reloved work? So it's um, sort of like vintage, would you say, or second hand? Um, not yes and no to vintage. I would say a lot of the dresses that we stock, I will try and keep them around about five years or younger so we have kind of vintage inspired pieces yeah such as like the tea length dresses mm-hmm. or um kind of 20s 50s inspired looking dresses but there aren't actually vintage dresses yeah. if that makes sense yeah totally. um so the idea is that um basically all the dresses that i have in store are example dresses from different bridal boutiques so for example when they're kind of changing over seasons um, and they don't really need those samples anymore. Um, a lot of people won't obviously go to like your sort of normal, uh, air quote normal bridal <laughs> shop to buy um, the sort of sample dresses. They'll go there because they want a brand new dress. Yeah. Um, 
So the boutiques will kind of get in touch with me and say, you know, the, these are what we've got. <clears throat> and I come, scoop them up, and then obviously they come to me, which I kind of quite like because I'm, I'm quite an emotionally led person. So I feel like I'm kind of letting the sample dresses fulfill their destiny because yeah. in the bridal shop they're getting picked the bride gets in it and they're like oh my gosh like I love this dress and then they order a new one for that bride and then the poor sample dress never makes it down the aisle so I kind of feel like I'm the fairy godmother for all these sample dresses (laughs) I will bring them into the shop they will find their bride they'll make it down the aisle and yeah I give give them their fairy tale ending as well the dresses so you're like Phoebe from France at the Christmas tree hundred percent yeah that's that's definitely me in the in the dress world for sure yeah. yeah and I guess with weddings something I've always found really interesting about wedding dresses is that to spend so much money on a dress that you wear once hundred percent crazy yeah. but like no judgment obviously but yeah. to me I've always been like I'm not sure if I would spend a lot on my wedding dress because yeah. I would only wear it once. Yeah, I think <clears throat> it just depends on the person. Um, I always find everybody's different, especially when people are talking about um, like wedding budgets. Mm-hmm. So say for example, two couples could have the exact same wedding budget, but obviously where they spend that budget, some people will yeah. put more into the dress, other people maybe put more into food, entertainment, whichever. So I think it just depends on the couple themselves and where they place that that kind of value. Um, I mean, certainly with wedding dresses, I always do find that it is so crazy. Like you say, you're you're wearing that gown, which is uh, obviously if they're designer dresses, they're so well made. There's so much yeah. kind of that goes into it, all the hand stitching, the manpower, the hours, um, the amount of material and things that go into them to make one dress. Yeah. For it to be worn for ten, even twelve hours maximum. Yeah. And then it's just not discarded because people will obviously um, keep them and they cherish, cherish them for for those reasons but just for it to kind of sit in a box or sit in a bag to never yeah, be used I just sad. I just find it it's kind of a little bit crazy when you're kind of thinking about it like that um, so kind of in terms of how much materials used it's usually about 20 to 40 meters worth mm-hmm. of, of fabric just for one dress um, so in terms of kind of textile wastage that's a lot of, of yeah. kind of wastage um, so anything that you could do I mean obviously if a dress is only worn for kind of 10 12 hours and then somebody else is obviously then wearing it purchasing it if if that's their thing to anyone else nobody at a wedding if you look fantastic in the dress that you have chosen nobody's gonna walk up to you and say where did you buy that dress is it second-hand is it an example how much did you pay for it did you pay full price for it no, they're not going to do that. At the end of the day, if you look fantastic in your dress, you look fantastic in your dress. Yeah. And if you know that you've got an absolute bargain, an absolute steal of a designer dress, and you're kind of helping um, in terms of kind of saving the planet a little bit, then, you know, why not? So Yeah, that is a really good point. So is it just the amount of material that affects <clears throat> the kind of sustainability of wedding dress absolutely not so there's obviously everything that goes into the, so obviously the amount of material that's used all the off cuts that are obviously wasted things like that but everything that's taken to obviously then make that material source that material the amount yeah. of kind of emissions that you're putting out there in terms of um, kind of obviously like things like water electric etc that's used to kind of power sewing machines power people yeah. all that kind of stuff as well so I believe it's round about 10 to 20 kilograms of emissions per wedding dress as well. Um, So if you imagine that's for every single bride, if they were buying a new dress, that's a lot that you're kind of pumping into the world. So if you can kind of cut that down a little bit and just be a bit more kind of conscious of it I mean I'm not saying that obviously everybody has to buy a pre-owned dress obviously that would be nice for me but I mean if that if that's not your thing that's not your thing but just knowing that there is that option and having a look at it before you kind of completely disregard it sort of thing I think yeah. is is quite important yeah totally and like we're sat in your like lovely shop and you know I wouldn't be able to tell that they yeah you know any different from a normal bridal shop well this shop. is the thing I mean in terms of like the environment of the shop I just tried to create something that's friendly welcoming because um, I've had experiences myself when I was married years ago mm. uh, first husband not second one um, 
where you kind of walked into a shop and it's kind of that pretty woman moment where they're just kind of looking mm-hmm. at you like you cannot afford anything in here like do not touch anything and it just doesn't make for a very nice atmosphere so for me atmosphere wise it's come in have a cup of tea have a biscuit tell me about your big day tell me about your other half how you would like to look on the day tell me about the overall feel of your day you know are you are you wanting something a little bit more traditional are you looking for something a bit more relaxed then kind of build up a picture of who you are as a person and what your style's like and then obviously go through um, the dresses that we have and just I always think just get the dresses on try them on because your dress is more of a feeling than anything else so you could have a, a an amazing idea of what you want for your dress but until you actually put it on and get the feels then you don't know if it's kind of the right one for you or not sort of thing. I think the thing is so many girls will come in and, and the, you can tell, you can see sometimes the fear in people's eyes when they come in because let's yeah. face it, we don't all hang out in bridal shops every day. You don't really know what to expect. You don't necessarily know what the etiquette is and things yeah. like that. So I think it's so important that you kind of feel comfortable in that space to just be yourself and kind of explore the different styles and fabrics and and things like that because it it can be quite um, intimidating or quite kind of overwhelming a lot of the time so I think it's quite important just to feel as chilled and relaxed as possible and and enjoy the experience because hopefully you'll only ever have to do it once so (laughs) you know enjoy it and and make it a fun experience yeah that's the thing I think like people don't know what to expect because like they've never done it before it's always that anxiety and fear of the unknown not knowing what's what's going to come around the corner sort of thing yeah like what are the rules (laughs) yes what what am I supposed to do do I have to to wear certain things so a lot of times I find that girls will go out and buy like whole new set of underwear and they have to have the white undies and a white strapless bra and things no come with whatever underwear is the most comfortable like for trying on dresses it does not matter Mm -hmm. it it really doesn't um obviously once you've selected your dress depending on what the structure of that dress is like we can then obviously advise what would be best underwear wise but for trying on no, comfort is key. Just come as you are and enjoy it, basically. Yeah, and don't wear fake tan. Exactly, yes. <laughs> no fake tan. <laughs> um, so what's your kind of, like, buying process? Like, do you have, like, a certain style that you like to try and find? Or where do you kind of, like, source things yeah, from? I think because we are obviously pre-owned and things like that, we're not limited to any designer. We're not limited to any season or any style. So I'll try my best to keep like a nice variety mm-hmm. um so that there is something for everyone so whether it be like the bigger ball gowns or just really relaxed kind of sheath type dresses yeah um a variety of different materials whether it's kind of the tools like your chiffons or something a bit more structured like your silks and satins things like that so i'll try my best to keep um quite a nice variety but every now and again a dress will come along and I'll just buy it and bring it into the shop because I just really like the look <laughs> of it because I think a lot of the times as well it's that kind of saying of if, if you love it then someone else will see your excitement enthusiasm for it so obviously I can then you know be a bit more excited about what the what the brides are trying on and things as well but yeah I'll, I'll try my best to keep a nice variety of styles fabrics different sizes um yeah cool so let's talk a bit about candle collective then so that came about when you were planning your wedding and you wanted to send your day yeah so i'd seen um a lot of people talking about kind of scenting your wedding day and things like that you hear a lot about brides kind of choosing which perfume they're going to have on their wedding day so it's a it's a similar sort of thing because obviously sometimes even though you don't realize it you can smell something um and then you could not smell that smell for like months on end and then you could have a whiff of it and it just takes you back instantly to a place a time a person so i think especially for your wedding day it's nice to kind of keep a hold of as much of that memory as possible so the idea of kind of setting our wedding day was something that i was really kind of interested in doing um so decided obviously being a bit of a candle lover anyway um, I thought I would have a, have a little go at kind of making my own so basically just started looking at um, YouTube videos and researching and things like that and getting as much information as possible um, and I kind of realised I'd opened a can of worms because I didn't realise <laughs> just 
quite how much actually went into candle making. I genuinely thought it was get some wax, get a container, throw a wick in it and you're kind of good to go. But there's really so much more in terms of the types of wax, the types of wicks, the size of wicks, what type of fragrance are you using fragrance oils, are you using essential oils, um, the size of the container in terms of the size of the wick, and there's lots of different um, aspects to it, which the more I got into it, I thought, right, I've, 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 got, I've taken in this much information now, like I have to kind of see it through. <laughs> um, so me being me just kind of bought a whole load of stuff and just started making and just there was a, a definitely a good few disastrous results but once you start kind of managing and nail it and getting the the sort of recipes and things right it's it's actually quite exciting um so during that kind of process of obviously trying to make something for our own wedding day giving candles and things to like friends and family to try and getting such nice feedback about them mm-hmm. It just kind of went from there and then Candle Collective UK just kind of naturally sort of happened from that point really. So I love that story. I love it when it's like a hobby and then it just kind of yeah, grew. It just it like snowballed. Literally grew arms, legs and just it just kind of took on a direction of its own really. So. Yeah. So and I am very naive to this. So I was like, surely you pour the wax in. So yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm interested to learn a bit more about it. Yeah. Um which I'm gonna ask you about in a minute. I feel like candles are like a gateway because you you're not into them and then maybe you got like a couple of like cheap ones from like Primark or Wilco yeah. or whatever and you're like oh, this is nice this is very ambient and then you find some more like pe- you f- people recommend their favorite candles a lot like on Instagram and stuff yeah yeah and then you start reading about what's actually in candles mm-hmm. and you find out that a lot of the not necessarily just the cheaper ones but a lot of the cheaper ones have kind of things that aren't good for us and things that aren't good for the environment so i know that you're very committed to making sure that yours are eco-friendly that go for us so could you talk us a little bit through that of course yeah um they say at the start kind of researching which types of wax and things to use i discovered that there was quite a lot of different varieties you've obviously got um like soy wax uh even things like beeswax things like that so Mm -hmm. There was a lot of of choice out there, so kind of doing a little bit of research into them, I decided to go for soy wax. Um, Purely from my point of view, what I was reading and finding out was that it was just a lot more, what I would say is eco-friendly. So to me that means, obviously with it being a, a vegetable wax, yeah. It's sustainable because you can easily plant more yeah. <laughs> and, get, and get a lot more that way. Um, but in terms of... Um, paraffin wax to kind of soy wax there's there's a bit of a debate like I wouldn't ever kind of demonize a paraffin candle because yeah. they have their place mm-hmm. um but it, it has there has been research done to sort of suggest that paraffin candles give off a lot more kind of toxin mm-hmm. um into the air so if you're not kind of careful with them they can result in you know not very good things happening for your for your health so there is kind of the the health benefit to using a a kind of more natural wax um, instead. Um, Yeah. But also, natural wax, there's a beeswax, but I didn't really want to go down that route because then it's not kind of vegan friendly. So it's finding something that kind of works um, as best as possible in in all aspects, really. Yeah, oh my gosh, so much to consider. So I did a little bit of research and I knew what kind of questions to ask you. Sure, yeah. And so I wasn't just coming into this like with idiotic questions, but and paraffin wax produces a lot of greenhouse gases as well. Yeah. So obviously that's not good for the environment because things like carbon dioxide, it's fine, sort of, you know, not but not the way we use it. Yeah. The amount we use, the heat that the sun produces, it can kind of trap it in the earth, and that's what contributes to yeah. global warming. So. I mean, with your paraffin, it's basically a. a a byproduct of petroleum mm-hmm. so you know it's something that you fill your car with so would you really want to sit in your garage and inhale everything that's coming out of the back of your car probably not so you kind of think well it's obviously on a smaller scale but it's it's uh-huh. the same same sort of scenario so I mean like I said one candle from made from paraffin in your house is not going to dramatically damage your health but 
if there is an option to have something slightly healthier, then I would always plump for the slightly healthier option. Is is you know get yeah. as is an eco friendly a product as you possibly can. So. Yeah, and I guess if you're like me and you just have candles burning constantly, yes. it's not good to be candles, breathing in candles all in every time. room of yeah. every scent that you could possibly think of. You know. Yeah, I found as well like with a lot of cheaper candles, and I thought it was just me, but apparently it's not. I get like a bit of a headache from them yeah, sometimes. Yeah, so I don't know if that's something 100%. to do with it. It it depends on kind of um obviously which which wax they're using the percentage of the oil what type of oil they're using as well um especially in candle making again there's a lot of talk around um essential oils in comparison to fragrance oils Mm -hmm. so obviously fragrance oils is what i use they are a man-made product it's not like an essential oil that is um obviously an essential oil like a a plant-based but depending on how you're burning it it actually changes how the oil works so for example um things like a tea tree oil when it's burnt it can actually be quite toxic yeah. to animals i've heard lots of reports about kind of lavender oils and things like that being quite um toxic um to animals so even though it's an essential oil and it sounds like it's going to be a good thing when you change its chemical compound by burning it it can actually have quite the opposite um opposite effect so it's, yeah you have to kind of look into these things as well yeah and i think one of the things that is really important to keep in mind is that just because something is man-made it doesn't mean it's bad definitely with the sort of man-made fragrance oils obviously they're rigorously tested um to make sure that they are safe to use whereas with the essential oils a lot of people will use them but they've never really been tested for candle use it's not it's not their main purpose their main purpose is obviously uh like massage or or things like that so they're not really meant to be used in candles yes Mm. some of them can and if you kind of look into it and you've done and paid for kind of chemical testing and things like that yeah great but for most candle makers it's it's quite a an awkward and hard thing to to do so yeah so what about the kind of packaging of candles as well? So I know yours really lovely, yeah, like absolutely. frosted glass. All my ones that I've used up, I just keep because they yeah. look really pretty. They've got like makeup brushes yeah. in and stuff now. I think that's the nicest thing. I wanted to use um, jars which looked nice around the home. They weren't kind of too intrusive. And like you say, something that you can reuse. So like yourself, I've got ones for makeup brushes. I've got um, my kind of reusable cotton pads in them. You can use them for all sorts of different things. So again, it's kind of thinking about as soon as the candle's finished, don't just throw it away, you know. Yeah. W- wash it out, which um, obviously I can let you know how to clean it out properly. Yes, that would be um, great. But just re- reusing as much as you possibly can, things like that. Um, with the, the the wax melts that we do, the clamshell packaging, mm-hmm. um, a lot of people will use um, kind of paper packaging, things like that. But the type of soy wax that I use, because um, there is more than one type of soy wax, there is variants on them as well. But the type of wax I use is quite a soft wax, mm-hmm. so it needs to be in something to yeah. kind of help keep it shape and things like that. So um, when I first started out, I was using more of a kind of um, PVC type um, plastic, and I hadn't realised it's it's quite a difficult plastic to recycle. I mean, yeah. essentially all plastics are recyclable, but if you're not kind of putting it into the right um, domain for it to be recycled, it's, it is quite difficult, and that's the sort of thing that ends up in the waterways. Yeah. So that was quite important for me to find a plastic that was as eco-friendly as possible, but still kind of maintain the integrity of the product. Yeah. Um, so I ended up using um, a re- recycled, I can't even say it, recycled polypropylene um, plastic. So it's a plastic which has already been recycled. It's super, super thin, which by the way, it makes it so much easier to pour the wax melts in, but that's, that's another story. Um, <laughs> super, super thin so that if it ends up in kind of household waste, it's more likely to be recycled again than the sort of PVC counterparts because it's a much harder plastic and yeah. in your normal kind of um, household recycling, if it doesn't end up in the right place, it's not going to be recycled. So it was quite important to me 
to make sure it had something that aesthetically for the brand kind of sat well but also had a little bit of a, a kind of eco benefit to it as well at the same time so yeah amazing I didn't even know that That's yeah really, there you go really learn something new. yeah but yeah in terms of kind of pouring those ones there's so much a lot harder because the wax that I poured before it was at a certain temperature but because obviously the plastic was a lot thicker it was fine yeah now with the the much kind of softer plastic I'm still having to pour it the same sort of temperature because that's important for the product and how it sets and how it works yeah but obviously with the plastic being a lot thinner a lot finer the warm wax loves to find any little um hole in the plastic or any sort of soft parts and I've had a few (laughs) leaking disasters where it's kind of ended up all over the table but it's you know to be honest it's it's kind of worth it those one or two that just end up all over the table it's worth it to know that you're kind of doing your bit as much as possible I think so yeah I think that's the thing isn't it it's like yeah it's not as convenient but yeah you know exactly if it takes me an extra 10 minutes to pour them I think for me, it sits on my mind a little bit better than just convenience of, yeah, I'll just smash a few out and it's done. You know, it, to me, it makes it makes it more exciting as a maker because you know you've spent more time on it. You've put a little bit more thought and effort and love into making the product as well, which then hopefully shows to, to the users of the product as well. So. Yeah, I know that like when I started buying your candles, that was definitely a big part of it. Yeah. I was like, okay, that's great because... Yeah, I'm buying candles, but also I'm yeah. not damaging the yeah, environment. Exactly. This is it. Trying, just trying to do as much as physically possible. I mean, even things down to when I um, get products in. Um, so like my glassware and things. Mm-hmm. A lot of the times it will be wrapped in bubble wrap or wrapped in like individual little plastic um, casings and things like that to stop them from scratching. But mm-hmm. obviously, rather than just throwing them away I will reuse them because then I'm sort of recycling those bits as well so any boxes that I get I'll always recycle the boxes and use them that way and even with the the kind of packing peanuts and things I've switched from kind of plasticky packing peanuts to cornstarch ones that basically stick them in a sink of water put the tap on and they just disintegrate so they're obviously um, biodegradable as well which is is great so yeah amazing so i have to ask you this go on what is the best way to wash out your candle okay. glass fabulous so depending on how much wax is left in it hopefully if it's one of ours and it's burnt really nicely down to the the bottom yeah um you should never burn a candle all the way to the bottom where there's literally no wax left because you run the risk of it becoming too hot and mm-hmm. breaking the glass blah 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 so there should be a small amount of wax left in the bottom so the easiest thing that I would recommend is just pop your oven on at 50 degrees, pop your glassware into there, mm-hmm. leave it sort of 5-10 minutes and then basically it should be um, melted enough that you can basically just pop the little wow. wax bar out the bottom. I'm going to do a little um, video of it at some point just so that you can kind of see um, exactly what I mean but it's the easiest way to get them out yeah. um, and then just with a, literally one paper towel it, wipe it out or scoop off all the excess wax and then you can just wash it out with warm water and then it's it's ready to go ready to use again yeah ready to pull your uh, lovely eco cotton pads exactly exactly (laughs) amazing thank you for sharing that you're welcome i know it's a a sort of mystery for many of us i think a lot of times people are kind of hammer and chisel trying to get the bottom of the wax out of it and things like that but yeah no that's the easiest way to do it just melt it down a little bit and it'll it should just kind of pop out cool thank you so your candle scents as well they're really unique i've not smelled anything like them before so how do you come up with those as a case of like a lot of experimenting or do you kind of have an idea in mind when you start creating them yeah i mean for the first collection that i've done which is the signature collection i want you to incorporate a little bit of everything so florals fruity something a little bit woodier in there as well so wanting to kind of have a little bit for every Mm -hmm. like nose taste if you like because again very much with fashion everyone's taste is different what one person's smell they might love another person might be like oh no that's you know that's not for me sort of thing so just making scents that are just a little bit different um Mm -hmm. and um yeah, th- things that kind of work well for the home, 
basically when you're thinking of scents because there's a lot of brands, candle brands that will do um, like perfume duplicates and things like that. Yeah. Um, which I love the idea of that, but I don't necessarily know if I want my home to smell like my perfume. Yeah. I want me to smell like my perfume, not <laughs> my, my house necessarily. So a lot of the scents that we do are scents that kind of work well in that sort of home environment. You know, there's scents that when you walk into the room, you know there's something there, you can pick up on that that scent, but it's not something that's kind of overpowering to the point where your nose is going to be like, oh no, you need to turn it off sort of thing. So I think it was really important to get a nice mixture of scents for, for every kind of um, taste, but also things, like I say, that work well in that home environment, whether it be something you're popping in your living room, in your kitchen, or the downstairs bathroom, you know, something that kind of works in every every room sort of thing. Yeah, because it's really hard to get that balance of like, it's yeah. so annoying to buy a candle, but you can't smell it unless it's yeah, like not lit. Definitely. But then at the same time, if it's too fragrant, it, it can give you a bit yeah. of a headache sometimes. It is quite hard to, to get that, that balance right between being able to smell it and not becoming nose blind to it. and But also at the same time, like you said, not being so overpowering that it just takes over everything so yeah yours are a good balance because thanks my boyfriend can smell them which means they smell enough but yeah. they don't you're not just thinking like that smell is overpowering. Yeah. like it's just nice in the background definitely Find it's, a little bit it's of ambience. <laughs> one that you can burn for that good few hours because you shouldn't um or we recommend that you don't burn a candle for any more than four hours at a time just um from a safety aspect heat mm-hmm. and flame and all that kind of stuff um so something that you can have on for that four hour period you know that it's going to fill the room nicely but when you kind of blow it out it's still oh. going to linger enough that you're you're getting kind of the most out of the scent as well but when it's lit and it's burning it's not kind of giving you a headache <laughs> yeah totally so and i know as well we talked a bit before and i know that you stock matches as well yeah because i used to use like the really long lighters yes um but they can be really bad as well yeah. just because you can kind of chuck them away definitely I guess. um i wanted to have match boxes that were pretty and exciting to use um because i think a lot of the times a candle is about that little bit of um what's the word i'm looking for like that little bit of luxury so it's not just having the candle itself it's the experience of getting home at the end of the day and thinking yeah I'm gonna pour myself a nice glass of something whether it be a wine or like me a nice cup of tea just sitting chilling and thinking right I'm gonna pop on my favorite candle so even it's it's kind of like that ritualistic sort of thing to it where you get your matches out you get everything ready you're lighting it and that sort of thing so I think in terms of the matches I wanted something that aesthetically looked really nice but yeah were nice to use at the same time so it gave it that that extra kind of luxury feel to using your candles as well yeah and it's it's a lot more satisfying to like light a match 100%, and light a candle. yeah there's something there's something nice about just kind of striking a match and hearing it kind of sliding down the strike paper and that little fizzle that it gives when it when it yeah. actually catches the the light um and obviously with the can uh, the, the candles the matches as well they're um like the long length ones so obviously as yeah. your candle burns down you're not going to burn your fingers they slot nicely into the the jars as well which is perfect yeah that's true it can be a hazard i used to like use a normal lighter and then like oh, if yeah, the candle was the getting to the bottom i'd like turn it yeah, upside down be like yeah. this can't be to and then you're p- turning the candle upside down and then some of the <laughs> wax starts to melt and it burns your fingers and yeah that's yes. not the relaxing experience yes, exactly it doesn't want. it doesn't really scream luxury relaxing candle when you're dripping wax all over yourself and yeah. giving yourself third degree burns from hot wax so. yeah that is all the question i've got for you so thank you so you're much very welcome. for thank speaking you. to me so where can people find you online buy your lovely candles if they're a local bride come visit you absolutely so if you're a bride and you're looking for your wedding dress we are based on egbeth road you can book an appointment via facebook instagram you can call you can email i'm like super contactable so you can get all of the details on the website which is www dot bridalreloved dot co dot uk uh, and use the store located in there to get all of my contact details but please do give me a follow on facebook and instagram because that will just give you a good idea of what we're about some of the different styles and the, and, and kind of the whole kind of feel behind the shop as well 
Um, candle wise, you'll find me sometimes at local markets and things. Um, to find out which markets I'm at, again, give me a follow Facebook, Instagram, which is just Candle Collective UK. Um, or if you'd like to have a little nosy at what we've got, then head to the website, which is www.candlecollective.co.uk. Thank you for listening to this episode of Eco Curious. This podcast was created by Superplanet. For more eco fun, follow me on Instagram at Superplanet. That's super with two O's. Please subscribe if you're listening on Apple Podcasts or follow if you're using Spotify. And if you're feeling really kind, please leave us a rating and a review. This is an independent podcast and it really does mean a lot to us. See you next week.